Have green groups been wrong about GM foods for a whole generation? A major study finds no harm from genetic modification. So is it time to embrace the technology? Also on today's program, how to get aid into Syria. The UN says it's struggling to reach nearly 600,000 civilians. Are airdrops the answer? And in picture this, produced from a printer, Airbus unveils the world's first fully flying 3D printed plane. Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. Since it became possible to genetically modify crops in the 1970s, campaign groups have warned tampering with science is dangerous for the environment and bad for our health. As such, bans have been in place in numerous countries and few crops have been grown commercially. But now the most comprehensive review by an independent group of scientists in the U.S. has found GM crops are safe for humans and the environment. It said modification had the potential to add health benefits to foods and increase yields to feed the world's hungry. Our newsmaker today is genetic modification as we ask if it's time to listen to the scientists and finally make the most of the technology. It's been hailed as the solution to world hunger. Genetic modification is becoming an everyday staple of our diets. The vast majority of scientists say it's as safe as any food. But for many consumers, it's still too much of an unknown. Now for the first time, a genetically modified animal is destined for our plates. US and Canadian regulators have approved genetically altered salmon as safe for human consumption. Dubbed the frankenfish, it contains a growth hormone gene from the Chinook salmon and a DNA promoter sequence from the eel-like fish, the ocean pout. It grows twice as fast as conventionally farmed Atlantic salmon. But there's already been resistance from environmental and consumer groups, concerned about the thoroughness of safety tests and the risk of contaminating wild salmon. Last month, the US National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine released a report reiterating that GM crops pose no safety risk. But scepticism and fear of GM organisms remains high. The anti-GM bloc. They say not enough is known about the risks to humans and the environment. With no universal regulation system, there's concern about the effect on natural farming and the potential global impact if something were to go wrong. Consumers and governments have pushed for products containing GMOs to be labelled. The US state of Vermont has introduced a new labelling law, which comes into effect next month. The EU already has strict rules around the labelling and growing of GM crops. The only commercial crop grown in the EU is a type of maize, but last year, the EU gave member countries the power to choose for themselves whether or not to plant GM crops. While this shows a sign of being less restrictive, the appetite amongst consumers still seems to be lacking. While many scientists are adamant about the safety of GM food, they also say that as yet, it isn't ending world hunger, failing to deliver the substantially increased yields it promised. Is genetic modification a failed experiment or does the science need to go further? And is a plate full of GMOs our likely future? Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now to discuss whether genetic modification is the future of cheaper, healthier food or a danger to the environment and our health is Claire Robinson. She's the editor of GM Watch and joins me from Manchester. And in London is Vivian Moses. He's the chairman of CropGen and a visiting professor of biotechnology at King's College. Thanks both of you for joining us. Vivian Moses, let me start with you, please, sir. Um, are GMOs safe, yes or no? Well, the evidence is that they are. As far as you can tell, they are. Of course, you can never be absolutely sure about anything being absolutely safe forever because you never know what tomorrow will bring. But the evidence we have, and it's really now very, very extensive, indeed suggests that it is indeed safe. Claire Robinson, the evidence is very extensive. According to the best available evidence we have and the consensus of the scientists, GMOs are safe. So what's your problem with GMOs? 
Well, first of all, I should say that this National Academy of Sciences report is not independent. The uh, institution actually takes money from the biotech industry, and this has been exposed. Um, also, the National Research Council, which was involved in this, uh, this report, also takes money from the biotech industry. The report has really failed to deal with a lot of the evidence showing harm from GM crops um, in animals. And uh, animal feeding studies show quite clearly that uh, liver and kidney damage and also immune responses can be caused by some GM crops when fed to animals. And really this report did not wholly deal with that. It didn't properly address it and it's not really surprising given the funding that comes from the biotech industry to the institution that's responsible for the report. Vivian Moses, are you aware of any case whatsoever of animals being harmed by GM? There, were, there has been a very famous report in particular from uh, France uh, two or three years ago about purported harm to rats. But this, uh, this research was so demolished by everybody, including six academies of sciences in France itself, that people have no, placed no credibility into it. So I have to say that there is no credible evidence of harm to animals. There is evidence, but most people reject that evidence as being worthless. And Claire Robinson, looking at the scientists, right, you, you, you feel that this National Academy of Sciences report is biased, you, you're not a fan of it. Let me, let me quote to you a Pew poll. 88% of scientists in the United States polled in that poll said GMOs were safe. That was in contrast to 57% of Americans who hold views like you do, who, and they're non-scientists who believe that GMOs are harmful. Now, to what do you attribute that, Claire? Because on the one hand, you have the scientists overwhelmingly, along the lines of scientists who agree that the Earth is warming, so we trust them for that, overwhelmingly saying GMOs are safe, but ordinary people going, we're not so sure, we don't trust it. To what do you attribute that, Claire? Yes, uh, first of all, we don't know what the particular expertise of the scientists who were polled was. It could be that actually they have uh, no experience of um, animal feeding studies. It could be they haven't even read the animal feeding studies. I find that often with plant biologists who are engaged in genetic engineering, they do not even read these studies. They certainly don't want to engage with them. Uh, we know nothing about these scientists, what their qualifications are, what their background is. So this is really a meaningless oh, statistic. So, Claire, are you, are you scientifically in, oh. qualified? Uh, I am not. I work okay. with scientists. And particularly, I'm very aware of a statement that was published in a peer-reviewed journal um, in 2015, signed by over 300 qualified scientists, saying that there is still no scientific consensus on GMO safety. Vivian Moses? Well, I'm afraid that Claire is doing what she's been doing, she and her colleagues have been doing for years. <clears throat> That's say, first of all, uh, casting aspersions on people, not on the basis of what they produce and what they write about, but who might have paid for them. That is a critical criterion with them all. And then you will notice that she herself is not a scientist and therefore she's getting her opinions from somebody else. She's not in a position to make a, a judgment for herself. And I think that what has happened and the reason why so many members of the public are, are taking the attitude that they are and are less enthusiastic than the scientists is because they've been scared for years and years and years and they, they're playing it safe. They quite honestly cannot for themselves sort out the sort of stories which are put out by the propagandists versus the scientific mm -hmm. evidence. They're not in a position to do that, and so they play it safe. Many people know about Bill Nye, the science guy. He's world famous. I, wanna, I want you to listen to a little clip of, uh, of Bill Nye, and, and then we'll come back to the discussion. Just, just take a look at this. The genetically modified food has no effect on us. It's, I mean, that is to say, there's no difference between it and organically raised food. This is scientifically provable. Okay. It's certainly provable to my satisfaction. And uh, that's like the most straightforward thing about it, is to see if it still is nutritious and see if, see if it has any al allergic effect. And it absolutely does not. And in fact, in general, all of these foods are more nutritious. 
Okay, Claire. And, and the reason I, I, I threw to that is uh, for, for multiple reasons. I'm not a scientist and neither are you. Bill Nye is. We trust him to teach our kids about science. We trust him to teach our kids about global warming and other things. Why do you not trust someone like Bill Nye who's saying, I have no dog in this fight. He's actually a liberal. He's liberal on many other issues. But he's someone who says, I'm looking at the evidence empirically and I'm sorry, it doesn't check out. This stuff is safe. Claire? Okay, first thing is that Bill Nye is not a specialist in this area. Uh, second thing is that he should read the statement by the 300 scientists, qualified scientists, saying that we are not convinced that genetically modified foods are safe. Third thing is that he should actually read the animal feeding studies showing that GM foods have caused liver and kidney problems and also immune responses in the animals that are fed GM crops. And by the way, it's not just the Serolini study from France. That was just one study among many, although it seems to be the only one that Vivian Moses wants to refer to. Vivian, let's, let's sort of change the focus a little bit and go away from whether it's safe or not to whether it's producing results or not. And I, and I guess... Uh, Claire might have a bit of a case here. When we look at the National Academy of Sciences study, uh, one of its interesting points that came out was that GMOs haven't increased the rate of crop yields uh, in terms of how it was promised globally. So there could be an argument, Vivian, that GMOs are purported to be magnificent for ending hunger worldwide. You can have smaller farm spaces and grow more food and you can cure hunger. But the evidence doesn't seem to suggest that that's working. Why not, Vivian? Well, I think there are a number of issues that are involved here. That when one talks about increased yields, you can talk about it in two ways. Whether the plants themselves have an intrinsic ability to produce more or whether the use of this technology and the plants made with it enables the farmer actually to increase his yield in the fields. And what has happened so far is that there has been very little of intrinsic benefit from genetically modified plants having increased yields, but a very considerable response in terms of reducing the losses in the field from weed incursion and from insect attack and from some other factors. So the yields actually obtained by farmers in many cases is considerably higher than it was before they used these crops. But that is not to say necessarily that the crops intrinsically have a high yield. Uh, getting a crop which is actually producing more of itself is a much more complicated matter than protecting it against insect attack or against weeds and so on. And so that's, that's clearly for the future. And people, um, people expect but have not yet delivered in any great mm -hmm. measure that this will happen. But, it, but the fact that you get more yield on the ground, which is actually sown for crops because of the protection against, uh, against uh, pests, is a re very real factor. People talk of, in some situations, up to 30%, but, okay. it, but it varies a lot. Okay, Claire, the study said that GMOs haven't increased the rate of crop yields. You're on board with that, right? Uh, yes, that's completely right. And re with regard to what Vivian said, um, the problem is that now weeds are getting resistant to the herbicides that are sprayed onto GM crops. And that means that there are uncontrollable weeds now in GM crop fields. And farmers are having to turn to more and more herbicides and even hand weeding mm. to try to deal with these weeds. So really, these are problems that are not particularly um, addressed by Vivian Moses. Also, there's a problem with BT pest um, resistance to now, BT crops. Claire, Claire, I, so the I, BT I don't wanna, insecticidal sorry to crops, the pests are now resistant. Sure, I, sorry to interrupt you, and I don't want to be accused of having stitched okay. you up here, but on the one hand, you're saying that you don't trust the study and that they're biased and they have dodgy funding, and on the other hand, you're saying you agree with what they came out with about uh, crop yields here, which one is it? Why would they, why would they say? Certainly. Why would um, they say that the, the, the crop yields are, are a problem if they were so biased in the pockets of the industry, Claire? 
certainly. Um, there are many things in this report which I and other people who oppose GM crops actually agree with. The evidence has become so o overwhelming against GM crops from many points of view that even the authors of this report had to admit that there were serious problems with them. Um, I'm certain that they only are holding out on, on the animal feeding studies and not admitting harm there because it's simply too inflammatory an issue and they don't know how to deal with it. So um, there is a lot in this report that I agree with and the crop yields is one of those things. Okay, Claire Robinson and Vivian Moses, I've got to move on, unfortunately. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Still to come on the newsmakers, should the UN begin airdropping aid into besieged areas of Syria? And in picture this, Airbus unveils the first 3D printed plane. Is this really the future of flying? Since the war began in Syria, getting aid to those trapped by fighting has proven difficult. Five years on, the UN says some 600,000 people remain stuck in besieged areas without food and medicine. Now the UN has a new strategy to reach them. It's asking the Syrian regime for permission to carry out airdrops. But given the regime denies people are starving, will it allow the missions and would they be safe? Christine Perovalakis reports. All the parties to the conflict have a duty to facilitate humanitarian access to populations in desperate need. Not in a week, not after further discussions, but right now, today. The Syrian government has severely curtailed the UN's ability to reach those in need. Nearly 600,000 people remain besieged in 19 different areas in Syria. Two-thirds are trapped by regime forces and the rest by armed opposition groups and militants. The Syrian regime has repeatedly refused to allow land convoys to deliver food, medicine and other supplies to rebel-tailed areas and has denied any starving is taking place. Actually, there were no starvation in Madaya. The main problem is that the armed terrorist groups steal the convoys and the trucks and they deviate them to their own warehouses and storage. And then they resell it to the civilians with, uh, you know, uh, prohibitant uh, uh, prices uh, that the civilians cannot afford it. Medaya is one of the towns besieged by Assad's forces that has received international aid. So has Daraya. But whether the people received what they needed is another question. The first convoy that entered last week brought medical supplies and even shampoo, but no food. People in Muadamiya and Al Bayir are eating leaves and grass to survive. Allowing aid into areas under siege is key to resuming peace talks to end a war that has killed nearly half a million people and displaced millions more. Syria has recently given the UN and the Red Cross approval to send aid into at least 11 of the 19 besieged areas but similar promises in the past have gone unfulfilled. So now the UN is insisting aid should be delivered by air, but it still needs the green light from Damascus. And that's not the only challenge. Flights can only carry relatively small amounts of aid. One land convoy is the equivalent of dozens of airdrops. Planes are in constant risk of being attacked by armed groups. And there is no guarantee that the food will reach the people in need. What Syrians really need is an end to the war. But for now, even getting their hands on food is a big challenge. Christine Pirovolakis, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me from Stockholm to discuss the challenges of getting aid to the people that need it most is Hamish de Breton Gordon. He's a former British Army officer and is now a chemical weapons advisor to NGOs operating in Syria and Iraq. Thank you very much for joining us, Hamish. Um, news that just came in very recently, the UN envoy Stefan de Mistura said that the Syrian regime has approved for aid convoys to all 19 besieged areas. 
but he said a lot is still needed. Is he being naive in, in still trying to go down this route? Well, certainly history would suggest that he is being naive, um, but we still must hope. Uh, I think uh, for a lot of places like Dara, who haven't received aid for three years, uh, we keep going round this boy where the uh, regime, Assad, suggests he'll allow convoys in and they never materialize. The Iraq, uh, the International Syrian Support Group agreed uh, if no aid got in by the 1st of June that they would then deliver airdrops to get this aid in. Uh, the UN then felt that they needed to ask permission to do this, which wasn't forthcoming. And each time we get to a position where the UN is going to do airdrops, um, Assad then comes up with some false promise, as we've just heard. Mm -hmm. So I doubt very much this aid will get in. I think what is very frustrating for those of us who are deeply involved in Syria is that uh, the Russians uh, allow Assad to airdrop aid into Deir Iza, which is surrounded by the so-called Islamic State, 46 airdrops in just the last few weeks. So I think it's about time that uh, the UN needs to be more demonstrative, plan for these airdrops. And Putin, it strikes me, you know, holds the trump card here. He's mm -hmm. allowed the airdrops into Deir Iza. Either he can allow force Assad to allow airdrops into area like Dara and elsewhere, or maybe Assad is calling the shots and Putin is not quite as strong and as powerful as we've been led to believe. Okay, and let me give you Ms. Tura again. Ms. Tura said a little bit earlier on that it can take six weeks of airdrops to deliver the same amount of aid to an area as a single convoy over land. And this is one of the reasons why they're doubling down and they're still trusting the process of sending these aid convoys over land. He has a strong point, doesn't he? Uh, airdrops, you, you drop the food, you're not even sure who's going to get it. Will it go into the hands of Daesh? Will it go into the hands of al-Nusra? Well, I, I would contest that. I mean, I think, first of all, if a bit of food falls into the wrong hands, Daesh, al-Nusra, or whatever, that, then, then that, that is a risk worth taking. I think we've seen with the Russian airdrops into Deir Iza, about 70 to 80 percent is getting to the people who need it. As far as the quantities are concerned, you know, again, I'd question that. Um, it depends how you do it. I think certainly, you know, if we use military aircraft, perhaps operating out of, uh, out of Cyprus, uh, a C-17 Globemaster can drop 65 tons of aid at a time. That is several truckloads. And I think operating with a number of aircraft, then you can actually get meaningful amounts of aid. A couple of Hercules C-130s, and some C-17s operating out of Cyprus could put hundreds of tons of aid into these areas every single day, which would equate to convoys. I would agree, ideally, we should be putting road convoys in here, but we've been around this boy for over three years now, and it's just not working. From the, hosp the, the charity I help support, OSM, who run hospitals in most of these besieged areas, People are really starving, properly starving. And if we don't get them food soon, they'll either turn right and join Daesh, Islamic State, or they'll turn left and exacerbate the already desperate mm -hmm. refugee problem. So I think this is, we are now, as Prime Minister Cameron has said, we're in last resort territory here, where airdrops, although far from perfect, at the moment offer a genuine of hope of getting meaningful amounts of aid into these besieged areas. And it is within Putin or Assad's gift to allow this to happen. Mm. Hamish, good to talk to you. Hamish de Breton Gordon, thank you very much for your thoughts. In today's picture, this Airbus has unveiled the world's first fully 3D printed aircraft. The mini plane was presented at the Berlin Air Show this week. Let's take a look.
handelt es sich zunächst einmal um einen Test, was mit der 3D-Drucktechnologie heute bereits möglich ist. And that's all from today's program. Our newsmaker was genetic modification as we asked if bans in several countries should be lifted against growing GM crops. A review by an independent group of scientists in the US has found GM crops are safe for human consumption and the environment. So is it time for governments to lift those bans and harness the technology? You've been watching this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. As always, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.